and welcome to another hobby cheating video and today it's time to talk about death guard so we're going to paint up a death guard marine um we're going to do it in the horus heresy type ish era scheme so it's going to be more white in fact it's going to look more like this guy so here's one that's already been done in that scheme and so that's what we're going to aim at i like this classic scheme a lot more uh the sort of white ish the sickly white green uh, more than I like the, I don't like that new green they did. So, so we're gonna stick with the, with Death Guard classic, as it were. Uh, scoot him to the back. And what we want to do is, on the whole, when we do these kind of things, we're going to be fairly desaturated with a lot of our main colors. So what we're gonna use today, the Dow, uh, for the armor, we're gonna use some sepia ink from Dollar Rowney. Uh, this is a very green brown, so very appropriate. You're gonna you're gonna see the green thing a lot. Um, we're gonna use this Sinai gray, which is an extremely desaturated uh, brown gray with a little bit of green tone in it. We're gonna use some cement gray, also from or from Vallejo, which again has a lot of green in it. We're gonna use some bright warm gray from uh, Pro Acryl, uh, which is more just like a it's just a warmer gray. And then we're going to top that off with some white gray at the high end. Now, I'm going to start over here in the airbrush booth just to lay down some initial colors and transitions. But the reality is we're going to do this over multiple steps. The Death Guard, especially the Heresy era color scheme, presents us with some really interesting and unique challenges because it's very white <laughs> like there it's it's just a very pale scheme and when we're dealing with uh color schemes that are that pale a lot of our our tricks that we normally like to use uh just suddenly don't work anymore that is to say things like zenithaling it up and um you know, than just putting a color over top or something. Well, that's not going to cut the mustard, right? Because uh, there's no color to it. It's it's very uh, it's very white gray, white gray green. And the reality is, is that that color doesn't glaze well. It doesn't go over zenithal. There's no such thing. Like it's not an actual color. It's so desaturated that we basically have no great options. So. I mean, in this case, I'm going to lay down some of my initial tones here with an airbrush. And so I'm going to show you how we be very careful with our airbrush and just set some directionality. Um, you could do the same work with a brush. And in our next step, we're going to go to brushwork and then we'll probably come back to the airbrush. So this is going to be a very fun tutorial because we'll actually go back and forth a little bit. So we're going to start by just sort of setting our shadows with the sepia and we're going to work our way up. Um, one of the interesting elements of working with uh, very white colors is that you do have to be you want to generally work up more than you're normally we're starting from a middle and then kind of working you know both down and up but the reality here is that uh, we just don't have that luxury because the, uh, the scheme behooves us starting a little darker and then just building up and building up. Airbrushing whiter, lighter colors in general is a little bit more of a, a tricky proposition because they're always going to be, if we're not careful, we're going to get ourselves into a situation where they're feeling very chalky, very, uh, just very fake, very airbrushed. Okay, like that's what's going to happen. And, and we don't want that. We want this to have a, a nice, rich, full tone to it. So you can see I'm just working my way around the model and I'm setting shadows. Now, I'm being more aggressive with this than I would, than like is actually going to be this brown green. Uh, hopefully I'm on camera there. Um, that is to say, I'm covering more of 
of this than I actually plan to. You know, she doesn't have his backpack on, by the way. That's a real sub assembly with this one is where, you know, we're keeping the, uh, the backpack off. I'm, I'm turning more this dark color than I actually intend to keep this dark color. But that's going to be very helpful later. Okay? So. We make sure we get all our shadows around where we want them. Including, like, on these undersides. You notice I didn't just, like, spray like crazy from underneath. We're not going for some kind of reverse zenithal here. This is careful airbrush work. We're going to use our... We're going to use our airbrush more as a precise tool here. We're going to use it a lot more like we would a paintbrush. Now, in this case, because I know somebody will ask, uh, I happen to be using uh, an Iwata uh, HPCH Highline, um, which has a, a does have a smaller uh, millimeter needle brush. But you could use anything. The key is we're using the dual action of our airbrush here. A lot of people get their airbrush and they just go like boop, boop, and that's how they paint. Like it goes all the way down and all the way back. When I'm painting with this, put my hand out here, this is about how much I'm pulling the trigger. Just tiny little amounts, right? Like that's how much my finger is moving right there. Okay. And you see paint come out there. That's how much it moves. All right. So, there you go. You can see we've got some some of that sepia laid up in there. Hopefully that's coming through. It's a very subtle tone, so hopefully it's still visible. It'll be very visible, if nothing else, when we move on to the next steps. Okay. So we've got some good shadows there. Yeah, good. Okay. And we're going to go ahead and dump our ink. All right, next up, we go to our cyanide gray. So this is, as I said, a very nice desaturated color. Um, we're going to thin this quite a bit. Um, because I want this to be nice and gentle. All of this is quite thin. The ratio I'm going to be working with here in general is like bare mins three to one thinner to paint. Okay, it's usually more like four to one. And these are already like, these are model air paints. So they're already quite thin, right? But like, again, we test on the back of our hand. I'll show you right there. That's about the coverage I'm getting out of that. Okay. All right. So then we kind of go over the top of what we just did. But we go a little bit farther. Here we can start playing with some like edges and stuff like that where we want to take them up. If there's anything that's not quite as white as we might want it, we want to hide some additional shadows anywhere. We can start doing that. You notice I'm keeping the air constantly going and I'm just moving my finger back and forth. Uh, so I'm not blowing paint this whole time. I'm just, now sometimes I'll turn it off and then when I do I go back to my hand. And I'll do that just to clear out because sometimes you get some tip dry. But I'm mostly just rotate or pull it using the trigger here. Okay. So now you can see he's getting some more brown in there. Hopefully that's showing up okay. That's probably better. You're still looking at mostly white if you look at that angle. There we are. Quick and easy. All right. And 
going to do a little quick change here. Just get rid of that paint. Easy peasy. Okay. Now we go to our cement gray. And <clears throat> the cement gray, which is this color, this sort of like greenish gray, is going to go over all the rest of the space, as well as some of the brown we've done. Now, why am I covering up everything? Because I want to start building up the white, and I don't want to rely on the sort of bright white of my primer. Okay? So instead, what I'm going to do is come in here because I want to make sure that when I put these transparent layers over top, that it's going over something that has a bit of a green tinge to it. Like that is to say, I don't want it to have that stark whiteness underneath. I want it to instead have the feeling of this sickly green. So I'm just being very careful. And by the way, it doesn't have to be perfect. You'll mess up. Like I'm being very careful with my airbrush here. If you mess up, it's no big deal. One of the nice parts about painting up like this is that we're gonna come back over. All this stuff will be painted again later. Like we're gonna hit this with more colors. So if we overspray a little or we cover a little too much, it's not the end of the world. There's no mistakes in miniature painting. There's just a chance to paint more. Yay, and that's always fun. So don't get afraid of your airbrush. Don't get afraid of accidentally painting too much of a color or backing out too much of a color or something like that. It's no big deal. You're not gonna hurt anything. This isn't, uh, this isn't nuclear peace. We're trying to negotiate here. It's a model. Everything will be fine. Okay, so now you can see we've <clears throat> tinted him all that color. Okay, all right, great. <clears throat> so, now, now is where we start having, <clears throat> excuse me, some fun. And in the airbrush here, in this stage, I'm actually going to jump straight to the white gray. We're going to use that Pro Acryl later on in the process. By the way, I'm just dumping water into, like, if you're curious as to how exactly I'm cleaning my paint cup, because I know I'm doing it off camera, <clears throat> I'm literally just taking a squeeze bottle like this and putting a bunch of water down in there to wet it all out, backfilling it, and then just dumping it, like literally dumping it, wiping the edge, and then blowing out the little bit of water left. And it's clean. Done. I don't push anything else through the, through the end of it that I don't have to. Okay. <clears throat> Now comes the fun part. So now we go to the white gray. Same thinning ratio here. And we want to have this much thinner because we want to make sure that uh, this stays nice and smooth. As always, the more uh, white that's in the paint, the easier it is for it to get chalky. Okay, so we test on the back of our hand. As always, we never put new paint in the airbrush and then just start spraying. So we always test first. Looks good. And then we just start rocking that brush. And what we want to do is we want to build out
that white color. We're gonna go over a lot of the work we did before, but we're doing it with this nice, thin, transparent layer. Like all, even the even white paint out of an airbrush still has a transparency to it. Notice how we're just applying little tiny bits of paint at a time. We don't have to turn him very uh, white with this color to make him feel like he's mostly that color. You can actually have a lot of other colors on a miniature and it will still read as that to the eye. About 50% of a surface is a given color. Your brain will pretty much do the rest of the work. Now we're just going to really focus in on those spots we want nice and highlighted. So like the dead center of the chest. <clears throat> center of the head. Because we want to make sure we're drawing lots of attention there. top of this here shoulder pad and then probably like bottom of the arm here we have some light gather there probably the top of that one maybe like a little bit more right in here knee looks like it needs a little love we just kind of work our way around Okay. <clears throat> you know what? Under that shoulder pad is just a little too dark. There we go. All right. So now we've got that base laid down. And again, we built it up and we covered a lot of our work, but that was intentional because we want it to be quite bright. Again, when we're working with a brush, it's gonna be much easier to come back down than it is to build up, right? White colors are always much more challenging to work with. They're drier, they're chalkier, they, they don't glaze easily, they don't anything easily, they're just generally a pain. So, what we do here is we build up to that white and we're going a little bit heavier than we might in the end want to. So that way when we start working with the brush, we can be a little more aggressive. Now obviously the other thing we need to do is reconstruct all of our edges, all of our, you know, sort of like the dark lines in between armor plates and stuff like that. This is very, if you're gonna do this with an airbrush as opposed to a brush, obviously it's fairly critical to start here because I could not have done most of that if I had, say, all of that metal painted or something, right? Or if I did, I would have had to be either masking things off or be really, really, really careful, right? So, but there we go. We've got some nice base tones laid down, some good color on him. Uh, we've got a good scheme. So now I'm gonna take you with us back over to the painting desk and uh, I'll show how we then continue to build this up. Back in just a moment. All right, so we're back over here at the painting desk. We've got our little guy here. Uh, he's ready to go. Uh, you can see what we did with the airbrush. And the funny thing is you might look at that and go, well, that doesn't look much different than what you started with. But I happen to have a second guy right here. And when you put them next to each other, you can really now see the difference, right? So you see how much colder this one is? right how much more black and just flat gray there is versus here where we've added these subtle green tones all over the place okay uh <clears throat> so we have taken control of the base colors of the thing it just when i take this away 
this one still feels a lot like this one did when we started, but obviously when you put them together, you're like, oh, never mind, that's really different. Okay, so I'm going to focus here. I've got the same five paints that I showed you previously here on my palette. Um, and as well, we're going to put down a little uh, Flow Aid, Flow Improver. Uh, this happens to be from War Colors, which is... I really like their flow improver. It's just mixed to a nice ratio. It's easy. Um, and we're going to focus here on this chest area because it's nice and visible. So the first thing I'm going to want I want to do is I want to the way I use my flow improver with stuff like this is I just soak it up in the brush and then I go ahead and wick it off. And the brush is already kind of moist, but not like soaking. It just it had some water in it that I'd done more or less same thing with. So now there's some flow improver up in that brush, but not a lot. Then I'm going to grab some of my ink. And you'll see that the flow improver, see how that makes that soak way down in? Like, really see how that's soaking up into the brush? <clears throat> so then we wick it off until we get our nice point back. We test on the back of our hand. By the way, this is like a size 2 brush, so you can use anything as long as it's got a nice point. And then what I want to do is I just want to go ahead and give us a nice line on some of this stuff that's going to be dark. So like these cracks in the armor around these um, I don't know whatever that is I don't know what that thing is tube tube receptacle it's a receptacle for tubes that's what it is and so I'm just kinda giving us I tilt my brush towards the metal piece, because I don't care if I get any paint on that, that's going to get painted later, this sort of like brocade edging, whatever it is. And that's the key when you're doing a line like this, that flow improver makes it so you get a nice, solid, very subtle line, right? Because we just want to create that, that illusion of shadow. I'm not going to worry about the rivets yet. We'll get the rivets later. There are little rivets here. I think they're visible. Yeah, they are. The other thing I'm going to then do is wet that down a little bit, and I want to start... <clears throat> I'm going to push a little bit of that up into those absolute shadows where I don't want the light. So, like, back there in the corner where it's hidden under his uh, under his shoulder pad, right? Where his sh you can see how the shoulder pad is sort of directly over that area. So we would want that in some more shadow. Great. Then what we're gonna do is a lot of our work here is actually, we're, gonna, we're not gonna use the, the cyanide gray directly. That is to say, not at this point. We're not gonna do any kind of layer of it like we did previously. Instead, this cement gray and by the way, I'm using these colors, as always, you could use anything that happens to match pretty close. Um, so this is a thin paint. I just kind of rinsed off the brush, kept it. And then what I'm going to do is just come in here and very slowly work a little more of those tones around. And I'm going to take my... <clears throat> my uh, uh, my bright warm gray. And you can see how that pops that up right immediately because it's a very strong color. Go back into the cement. And then I'm just going to go ahead and fuzz those edges. And working on a small section like this, working with something wet, where I'm working kind of wet on wet, is pretty important when it comes to to this kind of a color scheme when you're in these bright whites, because otherwise they're going to get uh, real chalky real fast. So you can also, if you're, if you're not confident in working just quickly like this, you can also use a little retardant medium, and that's fine. Then we take a little bit of our white gray where we want to really pop it out, and there we go, right? And so now you can see how much richer that area is. We 
we can go back, grab a little bit more of that cement, and just kind of work that in. Easy peasy. And that gives us basically the shape of the armor. Now, um, I'll do the knee plate here because that's a fun and interesting experiment with it to, to show you. But I'm just going to work my way around plate by plate on this thing, right? So once again, we go to our flow improver, we wick off the excess, we grab our sepia. In this case, there's a lot less here of this. So we probably want like a little bit back here, maybe a line like that. Like we're not actually lining the knee because it's not a hard recessed line in the same way. There's a crack over here on this side we want to get. I don't know if that's visible on camera or not. You can kind of see it there. He has like a little little tentacle right there. But then what we're going to do is we want to show that this piece is sorry, we want to show that this piece on the knee is hidden away. So we're going to bring some shadow up here, very lightly. Okay. And then we're going to tuck some shadow down there. Okay. Just real light touches. <clears throat> All right, so now we got that. We can be a little overtly aggressive. By the way, you might say, well, what are you using the cyanide gray for this one at all? I'm using it if I need to color correct out something. If I need to hit a little bit more of a deeper color, I'll use more of it the lower I get mixed in with this green to control the overall light. So like the, the farther down on him that I am, the darker that green will become. And like if you compare it to this guy, see how this down here on his leg has heavier shadows than this up here on his top? And that's because we just mixed in a little bit of that cyanide gray, right? Okay. And we can use that on some of these plates, we can use that cement as like our highest color if it's not facing the light. That can just be the shadow color, especially if it's over or mixed in with a little bit of that sepia. Or like we can grab some of the cyanide here where I want a shadow. And I can pull some of that down and that'll make that a deeper color. It's a minor change, but we're not dealing with, you know, that's part of the reason this is a challenging uh, paint scheme is because we're dealing with like really, really, really subtle color shifts. Right? This is all just basically sitting in the white spectrum. If I showed you some of these colors alone and didn't have other things next to them, you might just go, oh, that's white. I mean, it's not, but it does kind of look like it. And so then I just keep keep working that until I'm happy with how that's blended out. And then we grab a little bit of our pure white gray. And that becomes almost like our our edge color. Okay. So now we've got that knee ready to go. We can always come back and like pop edges with that white gray later. So for example, if I wanted to make the top of that, this plate, you know, if I want to get a nice strong light line on there, come in like that. 
sorry. Okay. So there we go. Now I'm just gonna continue that around the panels and we'll be back in a minute and we'll finish them up. All right, so we're back over here in the airbrush booth because we are going to finish this guy, his armor off uh, with a, a couple different final steps. So you can see where we are currently. He's, we've got all the armor color added in. You can see we've got some nice shadows. We've got some nice bright lights and stuff like that. But we want to put a little bit of <clears throat> more of that green color back into it. Now, I'm gonna do this with an airbrush. You could also simply do this with glazes. Um, by the way, we will have one more step after this. This Death Guard armor is complicated because it's all weathered and everything. But for this step, we're gonna use two different things. We're gonna grab some Athonian camo shade and we're gonna grab some just plain white uh, ink. Okay. And what we're going to do with both of those is pop out very carefully our uh, our shades and our highlights. So the first thing I'm going to do is take some of my Ethonian camo shade. I'm still going to use like a drop or two of thinner. This one will be a little more closer to one to one rather than thinning it way down. Um, but this is a very liquidy mix. Um, we are not, I'm using a wash or a shade color in the airbrush. We're just gonna grab a little pipette here. We grab a bunch, we go one, two, three, four. There we go. Put the rest back. But I am not intending to wash the miniature. A very common question that comes up is people are like, well, can you put washes through an airbrush and get a wash? The answer is no, it doesn't work like that because you need sort of a, a density of the paint to uh, to get it to actually wash. So instead, what we're gonna do here, that's about how much color it takes to actually do anything. You can see it's not doing a lot. But what it's gonna do is sort of smooth out some of these areas. And here we have to be very careful about where we're pointing. And you know, we, we wanna be have some situational awareness with our airbrush. This is just to build in some of that green tone. So we're just very subtly and carefully applying it around there. This is a, does not have a huge effect. The more you get the paint up on the white, the more, or on the lighter parts, the more visible it will be. It will not change much of your darker colors at all, uh, for obvious reasons. It's so hyper thin that there's just not a lot it can do. So, now I'm just working my way around, like barely pulling the trigger back. What this helps do is just smooth out some of those blends in the lower tones helps to build in a little bit more of a green color. By the way, if you really want a, if you want a slightly stronger green tone to this, you can always, um, uh, you could always just use like a real green paint or ink or something and thin it way down, way, way down. This just happens to be useful because it's already quite thin.
And you might ask, well, Vince, why are sometimes you, why are you sometimes keeping the trigger depressed and sometimes not? And the answer is it just depends on kind of the area and what I'm aiming at. And how well I know I can control it at that moment. Okay, so there we go. Now you can see now we've got a much richer contrast between these elements, right? Okay, so now we're gonna do the opposite, which is we took down the low contrast, or the, the sorry, the low color, and now we're gonna add in the high color. Okay. Just getting all that out of there real quick. There we go. Nice and clean. And that is the type of thing you want to apply very slowly, very carefully, because when it dries, it will have a stronger effect. Now this, we're going back to very, 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 very thin, because all of these inks are quite powerful. And we're not looking to really have much true white on this guy. Okay. So we do the back of our hand test. Good. You can see that's how much it takes to build it up. Okay. So now we have to be real careful about directionality. Sorry. Sorry, everybody. I hope not too much of that was off camera. I just realized I was about halfway through. But you can see I'm just working my way around, keeping the trigger depressed, but then only rocking it back slightly. And just really focusing on those areas. They don't want to pop way out there. Every so often, because it's white and it's very easy to get chalky and take it back to my hand and then I just blow some out to get it back to flowing again smoothly. You can always add a little more thinner midway through. Sometimes I see people not want to like add thinner partway through their, their airbrushing. You can always do that, who cares? If a mix is giving you some trouble, just add some more thinner partway through. No reason not to. Okay, and so now we've got this nice ultra high contrast. focused our light, pulled it to all the places we really 
want there to be bright light. Now it's overexposed at the moment because all these areas that are gonna end up being bronze or you know some other color aren't that color yet. So one of the tricks of this is you kind of have to have this like situational awareness of how much your vision is being screwed with by the fact that you have all this other stuff that you're looking at that's not colored appropriately yet, right? Like all of these shoulder plates that are right here, like this part is so bright white right now, but that's none of that's gonna be that color when we're done. This little pokey, boop, 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 pokey thing on his head, right? Same over here, like all of that is going to be, end up being a different color and it will change the way this feels when it's all done. So you kind of have to just have a sense of that. And after you paint the first one, you'll probably get a better sense of it, to be completely honest. All right, I think we're pretty much good to go there. We're gonna give this guy a final look over which is good because my white is wanting to, even with pure white ink, it still will eventually be like, nah, I'm done. All right. Just a little bit more on the knee there. I think that's probably good. A bit more there. Yep, all right. So, the last thing we're gonna do now is the Death Guard armor has all these like pock marks in it. I don't know for lack of a better term, right? It's these like dark pock marks here and here. Like there's a bunch of them around. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about how you pick those out with a brush. So that's gonna be our final element. Now at the end, after we're done with everything, we will also come back and weather this dude um, but that's just going to use the standard weathering techniques that you can see in things like my, you know, my battle damage video and stuff like that. So, uh, we'll go back to the desk and we'll talk about making sure all the pock marks are cleanly picked out because you want to make sure each of those stands out to help break up the, the, the armor. So we'll be back in just a moment. All right. So we're back over here at the desk and we've got our guy all ready to go. Uh, and our final thing we want to attack is the pock marks and cracks and just sort of stuff like that. And <clears throat> to do that, we're going to actually need to bring in some of the colors we've used so far. So we're going to get some of that Ethonian camo shade back out. We're going to have a little bit of this white ink. A little bit of the white gray and we'll stick with the cyanide gray. I need to refresh my white gray on my palette. Because what we want to do is each one of those little pock marks is basically a big, creates a little sort of reverse concave thing. Yeah, concave. There you go. <laughs> That's what it is. That's that shape. Right? And so what we want to make sure we're doing is taking that stuff into account. Now, you probably noticed that I already ran some of the shadow up under here, right? So what I did with some of these was I took some of the uh, sepia when I was working with it and I, uh, I had just like put a little bit of a glaze of that in there just to keep that going. So here we're gonna just drop a little bit of that Ethonian camo shade on the palette so we can work with it over here. Okay. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a little bit of this, grab some flow aid, and take some of our Sinai Gray, get a good amount of that over here so we can work with it. Okay. Then let's grab some of that Ethonian camo shade and just mix that in there. That'll give us two nice colors to work with, both of which are very thin, very liquid. Okay. And then what I want to do is in each little 
pockmark, I'm just going to come up on the underside and hit it with that combination. Okay, so I got to find, trace around this dude. He's got lots of little pock marks like that. Can also shove some down here if I want, like down at the bottom of this bone. Make sure that's nice and shaded down there. That only help. There's one on the back of his elbow, back of his arm. Oh, he's got a bunch on that arm in the little Nurgle shape. Okay, got some on that foot. Let's see, where else? So he's got a bunch right there. They like to hide this stuff everywhere on these Nurgle guys. So you really got to make sure you give the model a good once over. Find all your little, all your little pock marks wherever they've hidden them. And you get all those picked out. Okay. I think that's all of them. Great. Now what we do is a little two-step thing. So, because we want to make sure that we have the, if we've got the darker part of the top, we also need to have a light catch at the bottom. So we're going to go into some of our white gray here, grab a little bit of our white ink, just so it's a little bit brighter than what's around it. We'll grab some of that flow improver. go. And then what we're going to do is we're going to find the bottom side of it. And we're going to give that a little little kick. Right? I don't know if that shows up or not. And so we just find all of our little pock marks and we give all of them that little that little boost around all the bottoms. Sometimes it'll just be a little edge highlight. Sometimes it might be a little more. Some of these have some rather unusual shapes. You know, they're kind of organic. And whatever the shape is, you just kind of want to hit the lower side. If it's more in shadow, you hit less of it. If it's more exposed, you hit more of it. Like you're just trying to heed the light and basically pay attention to what the shape of the model is telling you. Now, white always goes on stronger than it dries, so that's something very important to keep in mind. <clears throat> the other thing you're going to do with this little, um, with this combination here, is if you've got some place that you want to be real strong, like if it's an area that's bright and very much exposed to light, you can go into the bottom of the pockmark and hit like just the center so that way you get like a nice transition there very small little effect the other thing you can do with this brighter combination is we can hit all of our edges so we can make sure that say like his knee has a nice little cut there same with his foot same with the center right maybe the center of his helmet we can grab the edges like this side. The, the light from this guy is coming like this. So we want to hit the edges of each of these little lines in his mask. Maybe we reinforce the bottom. We can put a little light catch right here on the center of his chest to warm that up. Maybe the same right there. Just little touches to really make that armor Pop out, All right? Maybe there. Get the tops of those fingers. The point is, anything you would want to be very, very bright. Okay. Anywhere where you need an edge, because the light would be catching on it. Like each of these fingers, we want to call those out. This armor, the armor segmentation on this stuff is really nice for this so we can make sure we get each of those little edges make sure we get each little 
fingertip. That one's very exposed, so we'll get the bottom center of that. That's a nice area we would want to pop out. Let's drop some pure white there. Maybe on the center of his head. The key is this is a very small value shift from the previous layer where we were. So it really just serves to intensify that white we already have just slightly. Okay. Probably the top of those. And there you go. That right there is your Death Guard armor. Like I said, from here you can do things like weather out of the pock marks. We can put some rust and stuff in there. Those kinds of things. Oh, there's a nice little edge here on his armor we, we'd want to get. Like this crack he has right here where, I don't know, I guess he has... I don't know what's supposed to be showing out of there. I think like organs or something? I don't know. Death Guard are weird models. But they are kind of fun. They're the only Nurgle thing I like painting because they're not too gross. They're like just the right amount of gross. Lots of Nurgle is just so disgusting. I don't know what to do with it. But this guy's kind of fun. Like he's still mostly armor. He's still mostly, uh, you know, a, a standard sort of like space marine image. It's just... He's got some other interesting qualities to him, like tentacles and like a, like a little tentacle holding a fun bell. Isn't that a good time? All right, so, but that's basically it. That's your Death Guard armor. Uh, so I know this process is long and involved. This is how, you know, people have asked me, Vince, how did you do your Death Guard armor? Well, here it is. Um, now what I'll say is, for this Death Guard armor, just to sum up at the end here, is there are simpler ways you can do it. You don't have to go through all the steps I did. If you wanted to do this more quickly or cut things out, you certainly could. The critical elements are, uh, like you could do this all with a brush and then just kind of try to airbrush and smooth it out. You could try to do more with just the airbrush. The critical elements are make sure that element, the critical things you want to, you really want to focus on are one, Make sure you have this subtle transition between a bright white and more of the green gray tone. You can do that in lots of different ways. The paints I did here through very gentle soft glazes of Athonian camo shade, that kind of thing will all work. Two, make sure your segments and your panels are all well defined. Like you can see how everything here has its nice light and dark lines separating it. You wanna make sure that's maintained. Three, you want to make sure that you're coming all the way up to pure white in only a very few spots that are really catching the light on this. Everything else should be muted down in some way. All right. So there you go. That's uh, that's Death Guard armor. Certainly hope you enjoyed it uh, or at least gave you some ideas and inspiration for your own sort of heresy era color scheme of the Death Guard there. But uh, I really like painting these guys. I think they're a very fun color. So... Uh, if you liked it, go ahead and give it a like. Subscribe for additional hobby cheating in the future. We have new videos here every Saturday. If you'd like to come take a class with me, you can look down below in the comments. I teach all over the UK and the US uh, this year, and I'd love to have you at one of my classes. Um, more classes are being added all the time. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to drop those down below. Always happy to help. But as always, I appreciate you watching this one, and we'll see you next time.